It's called the law of conservation of mass. Does that sound familiar to you? The law of conservation of mass. And especially the tagline sounds familiar. It says mass is neither created or destroyed. Right? Mass cannot be created or destroyed. That should seem like a really familiar tagline to you. And the law of conservation of mass just tells us that we can't bring atoms from nowhere and atoms don't disappear to nowhere, right? In a chemical reaction, atoms don't appear or disappear. They just rearrange themselves. And so in a chemical reaction, we have to satisfy the law of conservation of mass, Okay. What that means is that if I put four hydrogens into a chemical reaction, then that means four hydrogens must come out of that chemical reaction. They might be rearranged, they might be bonded to something else, but they have to come out of it. Right? They're not going to disappear into nowhere. And so the law of conservation of mass is simple at its, um, at its core, right? at its point, but it, um, it, it's really complex as to how we can represent that. Okay, so that's the first one, law of conservation of mass. Then they started, started doing a lot of experiments and started looking at chemical compounds in general. Do you know what I mean when I say a chemical compound? What's that mean? Yep, good. So a chemical compound is anything with uh, two or more elements. Oops, two or more elements that are bonded together. Okay, that would be the definition for a compound. And actually, I even want to say this, two or more atoms. Not necessarily two or more elements. It could be two atoms from the same element that are bonded together that form a compound. That's fine. Okay, but examples of compounds. Do we know any chemical compounds off the top of our head? Okay, what is it? What's the formula for water? Okay. Yes, I would agree there's hydrogen and oxygen. What's the ratio? H2O. Good. Do we know any other ones? NaCl. NaCl is salt, right? Table salt. C6H12O6. Good. And that is glucose. Good. What about what else? What about CO2? Do you recognize that? Carbon dioxide or CO would be carbon monoxide, right? All of these are different chemical compounds and they are just a, a, a bonded situation between two or more atoms, right? And so that's what happens in a chemical compound. It doesn't mean that they hang out next to each other, they are bonded, right? And we'll talk about what formulates, a, what, what constitutes a chemical bond. But all right, so the second law says it's called the law of definite proportions. And this seems really common sense, but it says a chemical compound contains the same elements in exactly the same proportions by mass regardless of the size of the sample or source of the compound. And so all that says is that once water was established to be H2O, then that will always be that formula, right? Water will always have a formula of H2O. We can't change the ratio because if we do, the properties of that compound will change, the look of that compound might change, right? All of these different things are dependent upon the ratio that was established. So we have H2O, that is water, and then there's another compound that looks really similar, H2O2. Anyone know what that compound is? It's hydrogen peroxide. So one of these compounds is essential to life. One of them is harmful, right? But they seem very similar. The only thing that's different is that you have one, one more oxygen, right? One of them I need to and want to drink. One of them I really don't, right? So that, that little change can make a huge difference in the properties of chemicals. Okay, so that ratio has to stay the same. Let me ask you this question here. Can I have water look like this? H O one half? No, why not? Yeah, I can't have half of an oxygen atom, right? Number one, I can't have half an oxygen atom. My ratio technically stays the same. I have twice as much hydrogen as oxygen, right? But I can't do it without a whole number ratio. It has to be a whole number ratio. So let me ask this question. Is H4O2 the same as water? No. Unfortunately, no, right? A good thought because my ratio is intact, but those two things behave differently. Once a compound is established, then that's it. That's the ratio, right? It has to be in that order, in that, um, 
I don't want to keep using the word ratio because I don't know if that's exactly right. In that proportion or in that, it, it has to be that set formula, right? We can't alter that formula because they will behave differently, okay? Yeah, good question. Um, all right, the last kind of chemical law that came out of this is uh, called the law of multiple proportions. And what it says is that we are able to combine elements, combine two elements in multiple ways to get multiple compounds, okay? So if we look at carbon and oxygen, for example, we can combine them in a lot of ways and form a lot of different compounds. The two of them that we just looked at were CO2 and CO. Both valid chemical formulas, both just have different arrangements. So this is called the law of multiple proportions. We are allowed to combine carbon and oxygen in more than one way, right? More than one ratio. Uh, and I think, again, I think these two seem relatively like common sense, but at the time they knew very little about how atoms bonded and what made up elements. And so they kind of laid some ground rules for that. Okay, but they have to be found by whole number atoms that chemically combine. Okay, whole number atoms, not partial atoms. Okay. All right, so we're going to hop forward a little bit now to what we consider the, the first theory of the atom, the first atomic theory. And we're going to run through um, his, okay, called John Dalton, that's his name. Dalton's atomic theory was really the first theory that was laid out about the atom. Okay, and we know a couple things of his theory to still be true today, and we know a couple things from his theory are not so true, right? We know, we know more information now than he did. So there are a couple things that we're going to fix and a couple um, things that are still true today, okay? So he said each element is made up of tiny particles called atoms. Do we agree with that? Yes, I would agree. I think we would agree with that. Do we know today that there are smaller parts to an atom? Yes. What are the smaller parts that reside in an atom? What are they? Protons, neutrons, and electrons, right? We know that. He didn't really have that vision yet, right? His vision was that this was an oxygen atom, and that's all there was to it, right? And this was the hydrogen atom and whatever. So we do think that's true, but now we know more information than that. So I'm gonna, I'll am gonna, i give you a slide later that kind of shows the, the things that we know today. But we, we agree that is true, but now we know that it can go even smaller, Okay. Second thing is atoms of a given element are identical and atoms of different elements are different. That seems obvious, right? Would, do, do you think we still agree with that today? This says every single oxygen atom is identical and then oxygen versus hydrogen atoms look different. Do we agree with that? Kind of. We agree with the second part. Atoms of different element are different. I would agree. But atoms of a given element are identical. We don't think that's true anymore, okay? And we're gonna study something in a little bit called an isotope. Does that word sound familiar to anybody? An isotope, we're gonna study those in just a little bit. Isotopes mean that they are two of the same type of element, but they have different masses. They have different numbers of neutrons. So we'll, we'll examine that here in just a little bit. So we, d we know that this is no longer fully true, okay? Um, chemical compounds are formed when atoms combine with each other. A given compound always has the same relative and types, relative numbers and types of atoms. I would agree with that, right? Once we, com once we establish a compound, that's the ratio, right? And I would agree with that. So I think that's still true for today. And then his theory lastly says chemical reactions involve reorganization of atoms, they change the way they are bound together, but the atoms themselves don't change. I would agree with that as well. Okay, so let's run through a real quick um, vision of a chemical reaction. Okay, and let's see what a chemical reaction looks like. I'm gonna show you how water is formed, right? We take a hydrogen molecule and an oxygen molecule, and we combine them to form water. Right, that's the basic formula of how water is formed. Hydrogen and oxygen bond together to form water. But let's let's look at what's happening here. Do we have are we satisfying the law of conservation of mass right now? I want you to count those atoms. I put in how many hydrogen atoms? Two. And how many hydrogen atoms did I get out? Two. So hydrogen's okay, but how many oxygen atoms did I put in? Two. And how many came out? 
only one. So that means I, my equation is not quite right in the ratio form yet. Okay, it's not, I'm sorry, it's not in the correct ratio yet. So I know that I put in two oxygens, which means I need to have two oxygens come out as a product. And so now by adding a two here, that tells me I need, I end up with two water molecules as my product. And so now that gives me two oxygen atoms, but what does it also change? The hydrogens. And so how many hydrogen atoms are a product of this right now? Four. And so I need to come over here and change my ratio of how these things are combined by saying I need to combine two hydrogen atoms I'm sorry, two hydrogen molecules with one oxygen molecule to be able to produce two water molecules. That is a, a balanced chemical reaction. And this reaction satisfies the law of conservation of mass. That's going to be something we study in later chapters, how to get to that point. But this is an example of a chemical reaction. If we have it, it satisfying the law of conservation of mass, we're saying that these atoms will rearrange themselves or reorganize themselves from the time they are reactant to the time they are a product. And so that's true here. The hydrogen started out bonded to each other, and now what are they bonded to? Oxygen. The oxygen. The oxygen started out bonded to each other, and now they're bonded to the hydrogen. So they reorganized um, within that chemical reaction. Okay, that's what happens in there. Do we remember what this side of our chemical reaction is called? Reactance. The reactants. And then what's the other side called? The products. Okay, good. The products. All right, very good. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the changes that we know today, right? We said that today we know atoms are made up of smaller parts, protons, neutrons, and electrons, right? Did I talk to you about why we abbreviate them that way? Protons because they have a positive charge, electrons because they have a negative charge. And today we know that the atom contains a nucleus and the nucleus contains the protons and the neutrons, right? That's where all the mass in our, our atom is located, okay? So let's talk about this until, up until this, this next experiment I'm gonna talk to you about, um, they envisioned the atom to look like this, right? A mixture of positives and negatives, right? They just kind of envisioned that the atom was this solid sphere that had all this stuff kind of just shoved into it, right? It was a mixture of positives and negatives until we discovered the nucleus. And so we're going to walk through kind of how the nucleus was discovered. I don't think I printed these pictures for you because it was going to throw off my printing, so I didn't. But let's talk about how the nucleus was discovered. Okay, um, we're going to look at this called, this is called Rutherford, was the name of the guy who ran this experiment, Rutherford's gold foil, oops, experiment. Okay, his name was Ernest Rutherford, and he discovered the nucleus. Have, have you heard that before? Have you heard that name? Mm, maybe, or heard of the gold foil experiment? Okay, so let's, let's take a big uh, picture here of what, what was happening. Right before this point, they envisioned the atom to be a sphere with a mixture of positives and negatives. So no discernible organization to the atom. That's what they knew so far. And so Rutherford wanted, I don't know, I don't really know even what he was trying to discover, but he, he ran this experiment called the gold foil experiment, and he put a piece of gold foil in the middle. He ran through a radioactive source or almost like a little laser beam. He sent through the gold foil what are called alpha particles. And the only thing I really need you to know about them is that they are positively charged particles, okay? So these particles he was shooting through the gold foil were positively charged. And so when he shot them through the gold foil, his expectation would be that everything just flows right through because if the atom as we know it is no discernible charge and no discernible organization, these positive particles should have no problem making it through that, right? But what happened was some of them did go right through, but some of them were deflected, okay? Some of these positively charged particles were deflected. And so what would they have had to hit to be deflected? A positive or a negative? A positive. They would have had to run into something else positive, right? Think about two ends of a magnet that don't want to be together. They'll swerve, right? Or they will, they will deflect, 
And so at this point, he, he had to start giving some kind of conclusion or, or coming up with some reason for why these particles were deflected, right? Why were these alpha particles being deflected? And so he came up with a new vision for the atom, what it might look like. And so this is um, kind of what he envisioned, right? Is that there must be some region in the atom that is positively charged, a dense, positively charged region, and he called it the nucleus, okay? A dense, positively charged region in the middle of the atom was what he called the nucleus. And we know that to be true today, that in an atom, there is a nucleus, and then there are electrons on the outer part of it. And so his model, he drew it up to look something like this. Okay, have you seen this model before? This is like the most standard like clip art chemistry thing you've ever seen, right? That's really what we're, what we're looking at here. And to be honest, today we know this to be a little bit untrue, but that's okay. Um, so he said that this region is positively charged. Okay, so this is called the Rutherford model of the atom. Rutherford model. Okay, and I don't know if I have a picture of that for you. Or no? Yes, no? You might want to sketch that so you have an idea of what it looks like, okay? This is the, called the Rutherford model, or it's also called the planetary model. Why do you think it might be called the planetary model? Yeah, it looks like planets in, in orbit, right? Orbiting something. Okay, so his idea on this model was that the nucleus contains protons and electrons. I'm sorry, protons and neutrons. And the electrons orbited along these paths, right? These orbital paths. And if that were to be true, that would mean that the rest of this atom is made up of empty space, right? If all these lines go away and quit blurring up our vision, we have electrons located very sparingly throughout our atom, right? So if these lines go away, the atom is left to look like a nucleus with a few electrons around the outside, which means most of my atom is empty space. Okay, most of my atom is empty space. And that's why so many of those, goal, those alpha particles were able to shoot right through because most of the atom truly is empty space in relative to the size of electrons, right? Think about how teeny tiny they are. Um, they're really far apart to each other in comparison to their size. And so a lot of this atom is empty space. Okay, we've got a small, densely positive region, and then our electrons orbit a little bit. Uh-huh. Why did he choose to use gold foil? Um, I think he just because he knew at that time they'd done some experiments with metals, and they knew that metals had electrons, and so they knew that there was something happening in the metals, but they didn't know a lot about other ones by that point, and that might have been the only thing available to him at that point. But yeah, that's a good question. Um. We know something a little different about how electrons are organized today, okay? And they kind of sit in little pockets and they don't, they don't necessarily orbit like this. But it was a big change from what they previously knew, right? Previously they said they're just little spheres and there's not really any organization. And so moving to this model was a really big deal, really big deal, because it just it gave the atom more organization than they were used to. Okay, so today we know um, that there's a nucleus, right? And there's organization within the atom. And we also know that atoms of the same element can be different, okay? So it, it, this is where we come into that isotopes discussion that we had. Items of this, I'm sorry, atoms of the same element can have different properties, okay? So they are called isotopes. They're atoms that have the same number of protons, but different numbers of neutrons, okay? And so they are called isotopes of one another. Bless you. Okay, um, tell me a couple things that we know before we get into our protons, neutrons, and electrons series. What do we know um, that is the single identifier of an atom? What's the one thing I can use to identify the atom? Do you know? Is it the number of protons, the number of neutrons, or the number of electrons? 
the number of protons. Protons is the number one identifier of an atom. And so to change the mass of an atom, I can either add protons or I can add neutrons because electrons have no discernible mass. I mean, they have mass, but uh, the, pr the mass of a proton is roughly like one one thousandth of a neutron and so and of a proton. So it really it does not add to the mass of an atom. So if I wanted to change the mass of the atom, I have two options. I could add or subtract neutrons or I can add or subtract protons. But what would happen if I would add or subtract protons? I would change the mass, but I would not only do that, I would also change the element, which would be a problem, right? If I add protons to something, that means now I'm not just adding mass, I'm changing the element, I'm changing the identity, so that's a problem. So the only way we can change the mass of an atom is with a neutron, and so that's where we come in with isotopes, okay? So here's an example or a picture of hydrogen's isotopes. Hydrogen has three isotopes, one of which just has a proton, no neutrons, and one electron. Second one is called deuterium. It has a proton and a neutron. And the last one's called tritium. It has a proton and two neutrons. Is there a way I can tell which of these isotopes is the most abundant? Okay, do you think there's any way to tell which of these is? Do you know what I mean when I say most abundant? the most common. Abundant would mean like it has a lot of it. So when I say abundant isotopes, that would mean I'm talking about like the most common of these isotopes. Okay. This would be like H1, H2, and H3. Okay. So I'm going to show you how we can discern which is the most abundant isotope or roughly that. Okay. I'm going to hand out your periodic table here um, into isotopes a little bit, okay? We're going to go down a little bit of a rabbit hole of isotopes. And isotopes, remember, are atoms of the same element that have different masses, okay? So the first thing that we need to understand about isotopes is that they can be displayed a lot of different ways. I can, I can typically list out isotopes like this. Carbon-12 and carbon-13 are both isotopes. They tell me that I'm dealing with the element carbon, but then this tells me the mass of that isotope. It doesn't necessarily tell me the number of neutrons. It tells me the total mass, okay? Do you remember what the total mass is calculated with? Mass is protons plus neutrons, okay? Protons plus neutrons, okay? So we're gonna go over that in just a little bit, but that's a little bit of a sidestep there, okay? So it tells me the mass of the isotope. That's one way I can display. If I want to talk about a certain isotope of carbon, I might list it like this, carbon-12 and carbon-13. That's how you would speak that through, okay? The second way that we display mass is on the periodic table. And the periodic table, on our periodic table, the mass is the number listed at the bottom of the box. And it has a bunch of decimal places. Do you see how it has a bunch of decimal places? Does that seem like a red flag, if we know that the mass is just protons plus neutrons, how can it be decimal places, right? That's where it gets interesting. The mass that's given to us on the periodic table is called an average atomic mass, okay? So it's called average atomic mass. And it is a weighted average of all known isotopes, okay? It's a weighted average of all the known isotopes of that particular element, okay? Let's, let's take a step back and see, figure out what do I mean when I say a weighted average, okay? Any ideas on what I mean when I say weighted average? Is it just add them up, divide by two? That would be a true average, right? But a weighted average means I take into consideration the fact that 90% of carbon's elements or carbon's atoms have a mass of 12 and only 10% have a mass of 13, right? I take into account the abundance of each isotope. 
okay? That's a weighted average. And so the number that is shown here takes into account the abundance of all of the different isotopes of an atom, okay? So if I was gonna look, I wanna take a look at the periodic table and I wanna look at fluorine. I want you to find fluorine. It's up here in the top corner. And the average atomic mass that's reported is what? 18.99 something, which is really close to what? 19. So if you had to guess what fluorine's most abundant isotope would be, what would you guess? Yeah, I would guess that fluorine's most abundant isotope is probably fluorine 19. Right, because look at how close that weighted average is to 19. That would mean its second most abundant isotope is probably fluorine 18, or at least fluorine less than 19, right? It could be 16, 17, whatever, 18, whatever it might be, but something is pulling that weighted average down just a little bit, okay? Do we see how that works? What if you have one like chlorine? So chlorine is right underneath. Chlorine's average atomic mass is 35.45. What information does that average give to you? Do I have one isotope that's really abundant? No, I'm probably splitting between two isotopes that are fairly abundant, which would mean chlorine might have two, one that's 35 and one that's 36 that are both relatively abundant, or it could be three or four or however many it is, but it means that there's not one that's completely overpowering. Does that kind of make sense what that information can tell us? Okay, um, so if I, look at, if I look at oxygen, what do you think oxygen's most abundant isotope is? 16, right, 15.99. If I look at hydrogen, out of these three, which is hydrogen's most abundant isotope? H1, right? Hydrogen. Because look, our average atomic mass is 1.0079. If I pulled 10,000 atoms, maybe only one of them would be H2 and maybe only one of them would be H3, right? We're talking trace, trace amounts, like really small amounts of that. Okay? So we did a little deep dive on isotopes there. Do we have kind of an understanding of what an isotope is? Okay, so a couple different ways we can look at that. Let's, let's go dive into now the mass and how do we count and how do we figure out how many neutrons and protons and electrons are in these atoms. Uh, this is most likely something you've done before. I don't know, do we agree with that? Have you, have you calculated protons, neutrons, electrons before? A little, okay, so atomic number is the total number of protons in an atom and we said that that is the identifier okay so you can identify any atom based on purely the number of protons and we in, in our boxes here where is the atomic number found top or bottom, bottom. no atomic number is it not on the top like mine yeah Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Oh, you're right here. Okay. On this one, it's the bottom. On your periodic table, where is that at in each box? The top. It's on the top. It's always going to be a whole number because I can't have a partial proton, can I? Okay, so in the periodic table, if you're unsure which one is which, the atomic number has to be, number one, lower, and number two, it has to be a whole number. Okay, so proton is always going to be a whole number. Atomic mass is protons plus neutrons in the nucleus of an isotope. So it's the number of protons plus neutrons. Um, this thing's called the nuclear symbol. I'm not gonna get too worked up about you memorizing what that looks like. If you were presented with something like that, um, let's say bromine 80 and 35, and you had to figure out which was the atomic mass and which was the atomic number, do I need to memorize that or can I, can I reason through which is which? Right, because which one has to be the atomic number? Five. This one has to be the atomic number because it's the number of protons only, and this is protons plus neutrons, so it's going to have to be the bigger number. The only element it wouldn't work for is hydrogen because they both have one, right? One proton is also the same as the atomic mass, okay? That's the only time it wouldn't work. 
Okay, let's actually do some calculations here. If I wanted to find protons, neutrons, and electrons, I can use those numbers to help me calculate them. Um, atomic number tells me the number of protons, but it also tells me the number of electrons if my atom is neutral. If my atom is neutral. What would, what would, do you know what I mean when I say neutral? Okay, it has a charge of zero. It has no charge. So to be electrically neutral means this atom has no charge. Okay, protons that equal the number of electrons would mean I have a neutral atom. Uh-huh. Did you also say it was like balanced? Yep, sure. Yep. Okay. If I'm looking at the atomic mass, I know it's the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. So if I want to find the number of neutrons, I'll subtract atomic mass minus atomic number. Okay, if I wanted to calculate that. So let's just do some practice. I've got one up here, but I'm not going to do that one. Let's do some practice here. Uh, I want you to look at a neutral sulfur atom. So find sulfur on your periodic table. Okay, it's an S and it's number 16. Okay, sulfur is number 16. I want you to tell me the number of protons, neutrons, and electrons in a neutral sulfur atom. Okay, protons, neutrons, and electrons. And we're going to choose atoms on here that we can round their mass to a whole number. Okay, so I want to round sulfur's atomic mass to a whole number. All right, number of protons. Allison, what do you think? Do you have a guess on protons? Okay, that's okay. Anyone think they have an idea on the number of protons? Raise your hand if you think you know it. Yeah, Katie. 16. 16. I would agree, right? Because that is its atomic number. What about, what has to be true then? If we know our, our atom is neutral, what has to be true about protons and electrons? They have to be equal. So that means I also know that I have 16 electrons. Okay. And then my neutron number has to be calculated. It's a calculated value. And so do we have a guess on our neutrons? What is it? 16. I think it's 16 also. That's a coincidence that they all end up the same, that neutrons and protons are the same. That doesn't always happen. Um, but I know that number because I took 32, which is the atomic mass, minus the number of protons, and that gives me the number of just neutrons. Okay. I told you to round that atomic mass to a whole number, so that's why we rounded it to 32. And we're able to take out our number of protons to get neutrons. Uh huh. Here, let's look at let's look at aluminum. So we're going to look at aluminum, and we're going to say that it is also neutral. I want to know protons, neutrons, and electrons for a neutral aluminum atom. What'd you say? 13. 13. Good. I would agree. 13 protons. What does that also tell me? Uh, electrons. electrons. Good. Is 13 good? Somebody have the neutrons calculated for me? Yeah. Adric, what do you think? 14. 14. I would agree because look at where our, our mass is at 26.98. So I'm going to round that to 27. That's the most abundant isotope. And then I'll take 27 minus 13 to get 14. Okay. On questions like this, I'll try to do a good job of picking numbers that we can round to a whole number, right? Atomic mass. I would be, it, it wouldn't make sense for me to ask you to find the number of neutrons in chlorine, 35.5, right? I can't have a half of a neutron, so that wouldn't do me any good, okay? All right. Um, I already gave you the answer here because of my PowerPoint came in funny, but that's okay. This says a certain isotope has 23 protons and 28 
neutrons, what's the atomic mass, and what's the element. So see if you can figure that out. What's the mass and what's the element? All right, so calculate the mass number or the atomic mass. What am I doing here? Or give me, give me your final answer, I guess, first. Grace, you have something for the mass number? This one we calculate. Atomic mass would be calculated here. Oh, I thought you were talking about the number that's going to be. Mm -mm. So this, this one right ha we have right here has 23 protons and 28 neutrons. So what would be the atomic mass? Yeah, Ethan, what did you have? 51. Okay, 51. And the units for atomic mass we haven't talked about, but the units are labeled AMU. They stand for atomic mass unit. Very clever, right? Okay, atomic mass unit. AMU is how you abbreviate that. And we use AMU anytime we're talking about a single atom. Okay, we're going to talk about it on a different scale later, but AMU is for a single atom. So what is the element? Raina, did you come up with what element it might be? Uh, yeah, good. Vanadium. Kind of hard to see on your... Um, vanadium, number 23 right? Did it make any sense for me to try to figure out uh, or, or search for uh, one that had a 51 atomic mass? Is that how I figured it out? No, I should have just looked at if it has 23 protons, it has to be number 23, right? That's it. They go in order. I just go find that element. Okay, very good. Questions with protons, neutrons, electrons? All right, last thing we're going to look at here is what happens if our, if our atom is not neutral, Okay, what happens if our atom is not neutral? It has a charge, okay? A non-neutral atom would have a charge, and it is called an ion, okay? So an ion is any atom that has a positive or a negative charge. Any atom that has a positive or negative charge. That would mean we have different numbers of electrons versus protons, okay? So our charge is dictated by electrons, okay? Pause your writing for just one second. I want you to think about this question I'm going to ask you. If I wanted to change the charge of my ion, could I change the number of protons? Yes or no? I can't because what would I also be changing? The element, right? I would be changing, if I change the number of protons, I wouldn't have that element anymore. I would have a different element. So the charge is dictated completely by the number of electrons in comparison to what we should have had. Okay? So here's a little bit more vocabulary here. If a charge is negative, that um, atom is called an anion. And if the charge is positive, it's called a cation. Okay, so if it, if it has a positive charge, it's called a cation. If it has a negative charge, it's called an anion. Uh -huh. Here's the way that somebody taught me to remember this, okay? And, and I'm not really, I, I have two different ways to remember this, but somebody taught me that if it has a positive charge, it's called a cation, right? Because it's positive, like a cat, okay? Positive. I'm not a cat person, so that one doesn't really work for me. But I like cation because it has a plus sign right in the name. Okay, so cation, positive charge, right? It's got a plus sign right there, so I know that. Anion is the other one, right? So it's a negatively charged thing, okay? So let's look at a couple examples here. If I wanted to look at lithium with a plus one charge, okay? It's not neutral anymore. It has a charge, and we always list the charge right up here in the top right, kind of like an exponent. Okay, that's the same place it kind of gets listed as by an exponent. So let's figure out how many protons, neutrons, and electrons are in this particular cation, right? It's a positively charged thing, so it's called a cation. How many protons, neutrons, and electrons are in this cation? I'm going to give you about a, a minute head start here, and then we'll work through.
All right, Abby, you got a guess on how many protons? Uh, eight. eight, good, I would agree. Jack, you got an idea on electrons then? It is 10, I would agree, because a negative two tells me I've got two more negatives than normal, so two more electrons. And then what about our neutrons? Uh, Bella, do you have a guess on the neutrons? Eight, Eight I would agree, right? Because that is unaffected by charge. So we would have taken 16 minus eight to get eight.